right? So you'll see here that the message is very consistent from this whole range. That the um, comple because of the complexity of genetic information and the challenge of interpretation of this kind of direct-to-consumer genetic testing, co consumers should not access genetic testing without a qualified healthcare professional. And you can see there's been a range. The first um, recommendation, policy recommendation here was in 2003, uh, 2004, all the way up through 2007 um, from a variety of professional bodies, both in, um, in the UK and many of them here. And um, you'll see here that the uh, Federal Trade Commission and the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in 2006 put out a consumer alert which basically said this. Um, saying we caution people, we, you should not be accessing genetic information unless you're doing that through a qualified healthcare professional. Um, we do not recommend that. And the other piece of that claim was that you probably aren't, because of the new stage of this kind of technology and information, you're probably not going to learn anything that you don't already know or that would change your medical management, your health care. As far as one of the questions people say was, you know, why aren't these tests regulated? Well, um, part of that is because as they have been developed, many of these, the testing process and the testing kits have been developed as homebrew tests. And that's a technical, it doesn't sound like a technical term, but it is a technical term, which basically means they don't count in the U.S. as a device, a medical device. And so the FDA does not regulate them if they're not a medical device. Um, the certification for laboratories is optional, so some of the companies actually do have CLIA certification and some sort of standardization. Others do not. It's not required. Um, state regulations vary. So you have a federal, the federal level of regulation, which is patchy. Uh, you also have state level reg regulation on genetic testing in general, not just this category of genetic testing. Again, that's very, that varies. Um, you may have heard last year, 2008, uh, that California and New York um, sent cease and desist letters to some of these more well-known direct-to-consumer genetic testing companies and said that um, they should have physicians involved in order to order the test. The test shouldn't be ordered without physician involvement. Um, so that's now the case in California and New York, but the other states not, not so. Um, one piece of legislation that was passed in order to, uh, it doesn't regulate the tests, but it does provide some protection around genetic information, would be the GINA, the Genetic in Insurance Non-Discrimination Act in 19, I'm sorry, 2008. And that covers health insurance. And it says basically that employers, um, insurance companies can't require you to take a genetic test or require genetic information to be given to them. It does not cover um, disability and life insurance. So part, partial protection, but that was, that was in the works for a very long time and people were very pleased that it was actually um, passed and there is some protection around genetic information because one of the reasons some people were arguing for this type of direct-to-consumer genetic testing is that they could access it outside of their medical record and get some type of genetic information um, and the thought was they could keep that private. And so they would avoid a certain level of genetic discrimination, say if you had a family that had particular conditions or the carrier status, that type of thing. The UK and Europe are also uh, wrestling with how to handle this new type of technology. Um, obviously, if it's available on, through the internet, you could be anywhere and order one of these tests. So even if it's, they're not being produced, the labs uh, or the companies are not based in your country. Um, how do you regulate that? International regulations, European regulations, so uh, the, the recommendations are similar, but um, no one's yet quite figured out how to regulate or whether they should be regulated. So there's a debate about that. <coughs> so that brings us to some of the ethical issues raised by the tests. And the first one is the potential harms. And I say potential because we don't always know, right? We don't know quite yet what, what it's going to be like. Um, and the potential harms, risks, and burdens. First of all, of course, false positives and false negatives. So the test tells you you have something when you don't, 
It tells you you don't have something when you do or you might get it. And people base decisions or lifestyle decisions or healthcare decisions um, on that information, which is not accurate. There's a difference, of course, as you all know, between a predictive test and a diagnostic test. These are largely predictive. And so it's saying you might get this down the line, or your risk goes up by 10% or 20% or 80%. Um, but it's predictive, so it can't tell you you're definitely going to get it or you're definitely not going to get it. Um, they, don't, they don't only tell you that your risk is increased, they'll tell you if your risk is decreased based on the genetic profile that they do. The second point here, this has been the, the source of quite a lot of the ethical and um, medical, scientific, professional debate about what do these tests actually tell us? How accurate are they? How valid are they? Um, what is the clinical utility of this whole range of tests? And again, remember the three different categories. The first category, we're a little clearer, a little more certain about the clinical utility there. We can take steps. Um, to either cl more closely monitor, say, somebody who has BRCA1 or 2, one of those mutations. Um, they might take specific preventive measures. There might be, you know, they might have um, closer monitoring by their physician. Uh, they might choose surgery. There are a whole range of things. With some of the other things where we're not sure how strong the association is, the question is, what does that really mean? What do we do with that information? Um, certainly the accuracy of the tests. Obviously, the companies are in competition with one another. They're not publishing that data. Um, they're also drawing from a whole range of studies that are happening all around. Um, even in the time that we've been conducting our, the study here, um, categories of tests and different types of tests get, at, get added, I would say, every couple weeks as far as what they're testing for and the results they're giving back. So it's a rapidly changing field. Um, the type and size of the association studies, again, they're looking for more people to be involved. Some of the studies might have had 100 people, some might have had multiple thousands. Um, but again, is that enough to be certain of the associations and what that means? The level of health professional involvement has been an ongoing consistent concern about the potential harms. Uh, many people have said, you know, this shouldn't be taking place without healthcare professionals involved. Some just some type of healthcare professional, not only physicians, uh, but genetics folks in genetics, genetic counselors, and in response, some of the companies um, always had that as an option but you either had to pay more for it or it was uh, very limited. Uh, some of the companies have responded and they have incorporated that, so either there's a, um, a doctor involved or a genetic counselor or access to a genetic counselor if you would like that service uh, pre and, of course, post-testing. Now, this kind of testing, if you order it online, um, is in contrast to clinical genetic testing where I might have a strong family history of, say, breast cancer, and so I want to see whether I might have that series of mutations. Um, so I go and talk to a genetic counselor first before I actually take the test to explore the options. What are the results going to look like? What are my options for results? They might tell me something. They might not. Do I really want that information? Um, so you're thinking about all that ahead of time, um, as well as help with interpreting the results and coping with whatever those results might be. Very different model if you're ordering it online and that's coming directly to your house uh, and you're sending off the, the kit with potentially no healthcare provider or healthcare professional involved. <clears throat> there also were some concerns raised about privacy and confidentiality. So what happens to this information? Who has access to it? Uh, will it get into the medical record? Will an insurance company have access? Or from the company's end, who has access to that information? And what are people going to do with that information um, if I take one of these direct-to-consumer genetic tests? Potential benefits. Um, you might get an accurate test result for some of these things. And that might mean true positives and true negatives. So that might give you information you didn't have before. Um, and certainly the way that the tests are marketed is that that may um, encourage people to take preventive measures. Perhaps things that they, you know, I should not eat french fries three times a week. I should go to the gym 
you know, more. I should diet. I should exercise more. And having this information might be the nudge that I need to do that. We all know we should do it, but it's hard to do it. Behavior change, lifestyle change we know is, is significantly difficult to do and then to maintain. So maybe I can do something to prevent myself from getting diabetes or from getting heart disease. Um, and so perhaps this kind of information would be um, additional to what I already know but enough to motivate me because it's about me specifically. We talked about the possibility of avoiding genetic discrimination if I go through my um, traditional medical pathway and have any kind of genetic testing or genetic information in my medical record. Um, this would not be unless I choose to talk to my doctor about it. So early on this was certainly one of the options and people were arguing that this was a potential benefit. The second area of um, ethical issue that was pretty hotly debated and still is, is the notion of autonomy, right? So you all know autonomy means self-determination or self-rule, self-government, and it's come to mean individual choice. So I should be able to choose whether I want to spend my 429 or my thousand dollars on this kind of testing and take that testing. You know, people spend their money in a whole variety of ways. Um, even if we narrowed it to health-related categories, people do a whole range of different things that they think are going to help them um, or be influential to their health. Um, normally, when we talk about autonomy, uh, certainly the U.S. version of autonomy is very strong on individual choice and individual rights. The flip side of that is, you know, what kind of limits do we place on autonomy? We don't live in a, no, none of us live in a society where there are no limits on autonomy and we usually limit autonomy based on um, potential harm to myself or to other people, right? And so are the potential harms of this kind of testing great enough to myself or to other people um, that it should be limited or curtailed in some way or not? And then, is there a right to know about my own genetic makeup? So why should the government or a state or any kind of regulatory body say, I can't know, have this information? And then there's the balance of, you know, if I have a right to this, what are the respons the correlative responsibilities that go with that? Uh, both for the individual as well as for, uh, for society. And then we come to the issue of justice, and this is where some of the societal issues come out, and certainly some of the issues for, for you as physicians are going to come out, specifically the use of resources. So there's a potential burden on internal medicine, primary care, and other specialties. Um, if this type of testing increases, uh, certainly the way it is constructed right now, where I just ordered as a consumer, that information comes back to me, I get the information, and then what do you think people are going to do with that? They're going to look at it, some of it they're going to understand, some of it they may not understand, and who are they going to talk to, right? So many people are going to want to talk to um, their physicians about that. Not everybody, but some are. And so what is that going to mean when somebody comes into your office and says, look, I took this test and um, it says I have an increased risk for diabetes, an increased risk for heart disease, um, and, you know, what do I do about that? What do I make of this kind of testing and this results? So time, staffing, uh, those conversations are not necessarily ones that fit neatly into, you know, a five or ten minute regular office visit. So, you know, what, what is the medical profession going to do with that kind of result? And, uh, I mean, obviously, many of you already have people coming in with things they print off the Internet, right, and want you to explain that, or they say, I found this really great cure for whatever, and, um, you know, can you look into it or can you tell me whether it's worthwhile? This is an extension of that, but it's specific information about them. Uh, a lot of discussion has also been had and, and people have acknowledged that um, depending on when you were trained, you may have had um, a little and you may have had a little bit more and you may have virtually not, no training specifically in genetics uh, that you're going to remember 10 years down the line or 5 years down the line when you have somebody come in. You may also not know specifically about this kind of testing or what, you know, what different um, SNPs the company's looking for. I mean, it's very, it, some, you can drill down uh, and find out exactly what they're looking at. And it's, you know, it's, some of it's quite technical information that, you know, most, most doctors aren't going to know because it's not their, their field. It's not their area of expertise. They don't need to know that on a day-to-day -day basis. So 
is that going to place an additional burden on you as physicians, but also on the medical genetics community and genetic counseling services? Uh, we, all, we already know that there aren't enough of them around, and so is this kind of testing actually going to increase that burden?